The train went up the track out of sight, around one of the hills of burnt timber. Nick sat down on a bundle of canvas and bedding the baggage man had picked out of the door of the baggage car. There was no town, nothing but the rails and burnt over country. The 13 saloons that lined the one street of Saney had not left a trace. The foundations of the Mansion House Hotel stuck above the ground. The stone was chipped and split by the fire. It was all that was left of the town of Saney. Even the surface had been burned off the ground. Nick looked at the burned over stretch of hillside where he had expected to find scattered houses of the town, then walked down the railroad track to the bridge over the river. The river was there. It swirled against the log piles of the bridge. Nick looked down into the clear brown water, colored from the pebbly bottom, and watched the trout keeping themselves steadily in the current with wavering fins. As he watched them, they changed their positions by quick angles, only to hold steady to fast water again. Nick watched them a long time. He watched them holding themselves with their noses into the current. Many trout in deep, fast-moving water. Slightly distorted as he watched far down through the glassy convict surface of the pool. Its surface pushing and swelling smooth against the resistance of the log-driven piles of the bridge. At the bottom of the pool were the big trout. Nick did not see them at first. Then he saw them at the bottom of the pool. Big trout looking to hold themselves on the gravel bottom in a varying mist of gravel and sand raised in spurts by the current. Nick looked down into the pool from the bridge. It was a hot day. A kingfisher flew up the stream. It was a long time since Nick had looked into a stream and seen trout. They were very satisfactory. As the shadow of the kingfisher moved up the stream, a big trout shot upstream in a long angle, only his shadow marking the angle then lost his shadow as he came through the surface of the water, caught the sun, and then, as he went back into the stream under the surface, his shadow seemed to float down the stream with the current, unresistant, to his post under the bridge, where he tightened, facing up into the current. Nick's heart tightened as the trout moved. He felt all the old feeling. He turned and looked down the stream. It stretched away, pebbly bottomed with shallows and big boulders, and a deep pool as it curved away from the foot of a bluff. Nick walked back up the ties to where his pack lay and the cinders beside the railway track. He was happy. He adjusted the pack harness around a bundle, pulling straps tight, slung the pack on his back, got his arms through the shoulder straps, and took some of the pool off his shoulders by leaning his forehead against a wide band of thump, thump line. Still, it was too heavy. It was much too heavy. He had his leather rod case in his hand and leaning forward to keep the weight of the pack high on his shoulders. He walked along the road, the parallel to the railway track, leaving the burn town behind him in the heat, and then turned off around a hill with a high fire scarred hill on either side onto a road that went back into the country. He walked along the road, feeling the ache from the pool of the heavy pack. The road climbed steadily. It was hard work walking uphill. His muscles ached, the day was hot, but Nick felt happy. He felt he had left everything behind, the need for thinking, the need to write, other needs. It was all back of him. From the time he had gotten down off the train and the baggage man had thrown his pack out of the open car door, things had been different. Sané was burned. The country was burned over and changed. But it did not matter. It could not all be burned. He knew that. He hiked along the road sweating in the sun, climbing across the range of hills that separated the railway from the Pine Plains. The road ran on, dipping occasionally, but always climbing. Nick went up, on up. Finally, the road, after going parallel to the burnt hillside, reached the top. Nick leaned back against a stump and slipped out of, of the pack harness. Ahead of him, as far as he could see, was the Pine Plain. The burned country stopped off the left with the range of hills. On ahead, islands of dark pine trees rose out of the plain. Far off to the left was the line of the river. Nick followed it with his eye and caught glints of water in the sun. There was nothing but the pine plain ahead of him until the far blue hills that marked the lake's superior height of land. He could hardly see them, faint and far away in the heat light over the plain. If he looked too steadily, they were gone. But if he only half looked, they were there, the far off hills of the height of land. Nick sat down against the charred stump and smoked a cigarette. 
His pack balanced on top of the stump, harness holding ready, a hollow molded in from his back. Nick sat smoking, looking out over the country. He did not need to get his map out. He knew where he was from the producing of the river. As he smoked, his legs stretched out in front of him. He noticed a grasshopper walk along the ground and up onto his woolen sock. The grasshopper was black, as if he had walked along the road climbing. He had started many grasshoppers from the dust. They were all black. They were not the big grasshoppers with yellow and black or red and black wings whirring out from their black wing sheathing as they flew up. They were just ordinary hoppers, but all city black in color. Nick wondered about them as he walked without really thinking about them. Now as he watched a black hopper that was nibbling at the wool of his sock with its four-way lip, he realized that they had all turned black from living in the burned over land. He realized that the fire must have come the year before, but the grasshoppers were all black now. He wondered how long they would stay that way. Carefully, he reached his hand down and took hold of the hopper by the wing. He turned him up, all of his legs walking in the air, and looked at his jointed belly. Yes, it was black too. Iridescent, where the back and head were dusty. <coughs> Go on, Hopper, Nick said, speaking out loud for the first time. Fly away somewhere. He tossed the grasshopper up into the air and watched him sail away to a charcoal stump across the road. Nick stood up. He leaned his back against the weight of his pack where it rested upright on the stump and got his arms through the shoulder straps. He stood with the pack on his back on the brow of the hill looking across the country toward the distance river and then stuck down the hillside away from the road. Underfoot the ground was good for walking. Two hundred yards down the hillside the fire line stopped. Then it was sweet fern, growing ankle high to walk through, and clumps of jack pines, as long undulating country with frequent rises and descents, sandy underfoot and the country alive again. Nick kept his direction by the sun. He knew where he wanted to strike the river, and he kept on through the pine plain, mounting small rises to see other rises ahead of him, and sometimes from the top of a rise, a great solid island of pines off to his right or his left, he broke off some sprigs of the heavy sweet fern and he put them under his pack straps. The chafing crushed it and he smelled it as he walked. He was tired and very hot, walking across the uneven, shadeless pine plain. At any time he knew he could strike the river by turning off to his left. It could not be more than a mile away, but he kept on towards the north to hit the river as far upstream as he could go in one day's of walking. For some time as he walked, Nick had been in sight of one of the big islands of pines standing out above the rolling high ground he was crossing. He dipped down, and then as he came slowly up the crest of the bridge, he turned and he made towards the pine trees. There was no underbrush in the island of pine trees. The trunks of the trees went straight up or slanted towards each other. The trunks were straight and brown without branches. The branches were high above. Some interlocked to make a solid shadow on the brown forest floor. Around the grove of trees was a bare space. It was brown and soft underfoot as Nick walked on it. This was the overlapping of the pine needle floor, extending out beyond the width of the high branches. The trees had grown tall and the branches moved higher, leaving in the sun this bare space they had once covered with shadow. Sharp at the edge of this extension of forest floor commenced a sweet fern. Nick slipped off his pack and lay down in the shade. He lay on his back and looked up into the pine trees. His neck and back and the small of his back rested as he stretched. The earth felt so good against his back. He looked up at the sky through the branches and then shut his eyes. He opened them and looked up again. There was a wind high up in the branches. He shut his eyes again and went to sleep. Nick woke, stiff and cramped. The sun was nearly down. His pack was heavy and the straps painful as he lifted it on. He leaned over with the pack on and picked up the leather rod case and started out from the pine trees across the sweet fern shell toward the river. He knew it could not be more than a mile. He came down a hillside covered with stumps into a meadow. At the edge of the meadow flowed the river. Nick was glad to get to the river. He walked upstream through the meadow. His trousers were soaked with dew as he walked. After a hot day, the dew had come quickly and heavily. The river made no sound. It was too fast and smooth. At the edge of the meadow, before he mounted to a piece of high ground to make camp, Nick looked down at the river, at the trout rising, 
They were rising to insects come from the swamp on the other side of the stream when the sun went down. The trout jumped out of the water to take them. While Nick walked through a little stretch of meadow alongside the stream, trout had jumped high out of the water. Now as he looked down the river, the insects must be settling on the surface, for the trout were feeding steadily all down the stream. As far down, the long stretch as he could see, the trout were rising, making circles all down the surface of the water, as though it was starting to rain. The ground rose, wooded and sandy, to overlook the meadow, the stretch of river, and the swamp. Nick dropped his pack and rod case and looked for a level piece of ground. He was very hungry, and he wanted to make his camp before he cooked. Between two jack pines, the ground was quite level. He took the axe out of the pack and chopped out two projecting roots. That leveled a piece of ground large enough to sleep on. He smoothed out the sandy soil with his hand and pulled all the sweet fern bushes by their roots. His hand smelled good from the sweet fern. He smoothed the uprooted earth. He did not want anything making lumps under the blankets. When he had the ground smooth, he spread his three blankets. One he folded double next to the ground. The other two he spread on top. With the axe, he slid off a bright slab of pine from one of the stumps and split it into pegs for a tent. He wanted them long and solid to hold in the ground. With the tent unpacked and spread on the ground, the pack leaning against the jack pine, looking much smaller, Nick tied the rope that served the tent for a ridge pole to the trunk of one of the pine trees and pulled the tent off the ground with the other end of the rope and tied it to the other pine. The tent hung on a rope like a canvas blanket on clothing. Nick poked a pole he had cut up by the back peak of the canvas and then made it a tent by pegging out its sides. He pegged the sides out taut and drove the pegs deep, hitting them down into the ground with the flat of the axe until the rope loops were buried and the canvas drum was tight. Across the open mouth of the tent, Nick fixed cheesecloth to keep out mosquitoes. He crawled inside under the mosquito bar with various things from the pack to put at the head of the bed under the slant of the canvas. Inside the tent, the light came through the brown canvas. It smelled pleasantly of canvas. Already there was something mysterious and homelike. Nick was happy as he crawled inside the tent. He had not been unhappy all day. This was different, though. Now things were done. There had been this to do. Now it was done. It had been a hard trip. He was very tired. That was done. He had made his camp. He was settled. Nothing could touch him. It was a good place to camp. He was there in the good place. He was in his home, where he had made it. Now he was hungry. He came out, crawling under the cheesecloth. It was quite dark outside. It was lighter in the tent. Nick went over to the pack and found with his fingers a long nail and a paper sack of nails. In the bottom of the pack, he drove it into a pine tree, holding it close and hitting it gently with the flat of the ax. He hung the pack up on the nail. All the supplies were in the pack. They were off the ground and sheltered now. Nick was hungry. He did not believe he had ever been hungry. He opened and emptied a can of pork and beans and a can of spaghetti into a frying pan. I've got a right to eat this kind of stuff if I'm willing to carry it, Nick said. His voice sounded strange in the darkening woods. He did not speak again. He started a fire with some chunks of pine he got with an axe from a stump. Over the fire, he stuck a wire grill pushing the four legs down to the ground with his boot. Nick put the frying pan on the grill over the flames. He was hungrier. The beans and spaghetti warmed. Nick stirred them and mixed them together. They began to bubble, making little bubbles that rose with difficulty to the surface. There was a good smell. Nick got out a bottle of tomato ketchup and cut four slices of bread. The little bubbles were coming faster now. Nick sat down beside the fire and lifted the frying pan off. He poured about half the contents out into a tin plate. It spread very slowly on the plate. Nick knew it was too hot. He poured on some of the tomato ketchup. He knew the beans and spaghetti were still too hot. He looked at the fire, then at the tent. He was not going to spoil it all by burning his tongue. For years, he had never enjoyed fried bananas because he had never been able to wait for them to cool. His tongue was very sensitive. He was very hungry. Across the river, in the swamp, in the almost dark, he saw a mist rising. He looked at the tent once more. All right. He took a full spoonful from the plate. Christ, Nick said. Jesus Christ, he smiled happily. He ate the whole plateful before he remembered the bread. 
Nick finished the second plateful with the bread, mopping the plate shine. He had not eaten since a cup of coffee and a ham sandwich in the station restaurant at St. Ignace. It had been a very fine experience. He had been that hungry before, but had not been able to satisfy it. He could have made camp hours before if he had wanted to. There were plenty of good places to camp on the river, but this was good. Nick tucked two big chips of pine under the grill. The fire flared up. He had forgotten to get water for the coffee. Out of the pack, he got the folding canvas bucket and walked down the hill, across the edge of the meadow, to the stream. The other bank was in the white mist. The grass was wet and cold as he knelt on the bank and dipped the canvas bucket into the stream. It belly and pulled hard in the current. The water was ice cold. Nick rinsed the bucket and carried it full up to the camp. Away from the stream, it was not so cold. Nick drove another big nail and hung the bucket full of water. He dipped the coffee pot half full and put some more chips under the grill onto the fire and put the pot on. He could not remember which way he made coffee. He could remember an argument about it with Hopkins, not which side he had taken. He decided to bring it to a boil. He remembered now. That was Hopkins' way. He had once argued about everything with Hopkins. While he waited for the coffee to boil, he opened a small can of apricots. He liked to open cans. He emptied the can of apricots out into a tin cup. While he watched the coffee on the fire, he drank the juice, juice syrup, with the apricots, carefully at first to keep from spilling, then meditatively sucking the apricots down. They were better fre than fresh apricots. The coffee boiled as he watched. The lid came up and the coffee and grounds ran down the side of the pot. Nick took it off the grill. It was a triumph for Hopkins. He put sugar in the empty apricot cup and poured some of the coffee out to cool. It was too hot to pour it, and he used his hat to hold the handle of the coffee pot. He would not let it steep in the pot at all. Not the first cup. It should be straight. Hopkins all the way. Hop served that. He was a very serious coffee drinker. He was the most serious man Nick had ever known. Not heavy, serious. That was a long time ago. Hopkins spoke without moving his lips. He had played polo. He made millions of dollars in Texas. He had borrowed car fare to go to Chicago when the wire came that his first big well had come in. He could have wired for money. That would have been too slow. They called Hop's girl the blonde Venus. Hop did not mind because she was not his real girl. Hopkins said very confidently that none of them would make fun of his real girl. He was right. Hopkins went away from him when the telegram came. That was on the Black River. It took eight days for the telegram to reach him. Hopkins gave away his 22 caliber Colt automatic pistol to Nick. He gave his camera to Bill. It was to remember him always by. They were all going fishing again next summer. The hophead was rich. He would get a yacht and they would all cruise along the north shore of Lake Superior. He was excited but serious. They said goodbye and it all felt bad. It broke up the trip. They never saw Hopkins again. It was a long time ago on the Black River. Nick drank the coffee. The coffee, according to Hopkins, the coffee was bitter. Nick laughed. It made a good ending to the story. His mind was starting to work. He knew he could choke it because he was tired enough. He spilled the coffee out of the pot and shook the grounds loose into the fire. He lit a cigarette and went inside the tent. He took off his shoes and trousers, sitting on the blankets, rolled the shoes up inside the trousers for a pillow, and got between the blankets. Out through the front of the tent, he watched the glow of the fire. When the night wind blew on it, it was a quiet night. The swamp was perfectly quiet. Nick stretched under a blanket comfortably. A mosquito hummed close to his ear. Nick sat up and lit a match. The mosquito was on the canvas over his head. Nick moved the match quickly up, up to it. The mosquito made a satisfactory hiss in the flame. The match went out. Nick lay down again under the blanket. He turned outside and shut his eyes. He was sleepy. He felt sleep coming. He crawled up under the blanket and went to sleep. Big Hearted River. Oh. Oh, by Ernest Hemingway, of course. Part two. <laughs> in the morning, the sun was up and the tent was starting to get hot. Nick crawled out under the mosquito netting, stretched across the mouth of the tent to look at the morning. The grass was wet on his hands as he came out. 
He held his trousers and his shoes in his hands. The sun was up just over the hill. There was a meadow, the river, and the swamp. There were birch trees in the green of the swamp on the other side of the river. The river was clear and smoothly fast in the early morning. Down about 200 yards, there were three logs all the way across the stream. They made the water smooth and deep above them. As Nick watched, a mink crossed the river on the logs and went into the swamp. Nick was excited. He was excited by the early morning in the river. He was really too hurried to eat breakfast, but he knew he must. He built a little fire and put on the coffee pot. While the water was heating in the pot, he took an empty bottle and went down over the edge of the high ground to the meadow. The meadow was wet with dew. Nick wanted to catch grasshoppers for bait before the sun dried the grass. He found plenty of good grasshoppers. They were at the base of the grass stems. Sometimes they clung to a grass stem. They were cold and wet with dew and could not jump until the sun warmed them. Nick picked them up, taking only the medium-sized brown ones, and put them into the bottle. He turned over a log, and just under the shelter of the edge were several hundred hoppers. It was a grasshopper lodging house. Nick put about 50 of the medium brown ones into a bottle. While he was picking up the hoppers, the others warmed in the sun and commenced to hop away. They flew when they hopped. At first, they made one flight, stayed stiff when they landed, so they were dead. Nick knew that by the time he was through with breakfast, they would be as lively as ever. Without dew in the grass, it would take him all day to catch a bottle full of good grasshoppers, and he would have to crush many of them, slamming them with his hat. He washed his hands in the stream. He was excited to be near it. Then he walked up to the tent. The hoppers were already jumping stiffly in the grass. In the bottle, worn by the sun, they were jumping in mass. Nick put in a pine stick as a cork. It plugged the mouth of the bottle enough so the hoppers could knock it out and left plenty of air passage. He had rolled the log back, and he knew he could get grasshoppers there every morning. Nick laid the bottle full of jumping grasshoppers against the pine trunk. Rapidly, he mixed some buckwheat flour with water and stirred it smooth. One cup of flour, one cup of water. He put a handful of coffee into the pot and dipped a lump of grease out of a can and slid it, sputtering across the hot skillet. On the smoky skillet, he poured smoothly the buckwheat batter. It spread like lava, the grease spitting sharply. Around the edges of the buckwheat cake began to firm, then brown, then crisp. The surface of the bubbling slowly to porousness. Nick pushed under the browned undersurface with a fresh pine chip. He took the skillet sideways and the cake was loose on the surface. I won't try and flop it, he thought. He slid the chip clean wood all the way under the cake and flopped it over onto its face. It sputtered in a pan. When it was cooked, Nick re-greased the skillet. He used all the batter. It made another big flapjack and one smaller one. Nick ate the big flapjack and the smaller one, covered with apple butter. He put the apple butter on the third cake, folded it over twice, wrapped it in oiled paper, and put it in his shirt pocket. He put the apple butter jar back in his pack and he cut bread for two sandwiches. In the pack, he found a big onion. He sliced it in two and peeled the silky outer skin. Then he cut one half into slices and he made onion sandwiches. He wrapped them in oiled paper and buttoned them in the other pocket of his khaki shirt. He turned the skillet upside down on the grill, drank the coffee, sweetened and yellow brown with condensed milk in it, tidied up the camp. It was a good day. It was a good camp. Nick took his fly rod out of the leather rod case, jointed it, and shoved the rod case back into the tent. He put on the reel and threaded the line through the guides. He had to hold it from hand to hand as he threaded it, or it would slip back through its own weight. It was heavy, doubled taper fly line. Nick had paid $8 for it a long time ago. It was made heavy to lift the back in there and come forward flat and heavy and straight to make it possible to cast a fly, which has no weight. Nick opened the aluminum leader box. The letters were coiled between damp flannel pads. Nick had wet the pads at the water cooler and train up at, to St. Ignatius. In the damp pads, the gut leaders had softened, and Nick unrolled one and tied it by a loop to the end of a heavy fly line. He fastened a hook on the end of the leader. It was a small hook, very thin and springy. Nick took it 
from his hook book sitting with the rod across his lap. He tested the knot and the spring of the rod by pulling the line taut. It was a good feeling. He was careful not to let the hook bite into his finger. He started down the stream holding his rod. The bottle of grasshoppers hung from his neck by a thong tied in half hitches around the neck of the bottle. His landing net hung by a hook on his belt. Over his shoulders was a long flower sack tied at each corner into an ear. The cord went over his shoulder. The sack flapped against his legs. Nick felt awkward and professionally happy with all of his equipment hanging from him. The grasshopper bottle swung against his chest. In his shirt, the breast pockets bulged against him with lunch and his flybook. He stepped into the stream. It was a shock. His trousers clung tight to his legs. His shoes felt the gravel. The water was a rising cold shock. Rushing, the current sucked against his legs. Where he stepped in, the water was over his knees. He wadded with the current. The gravel slid under his shoes. He looked down at the swirl of water below each leg and tipped up the bottle to get a grasshopper. The first grasshopper gave a jump in the neck of the bottle and went into the water. He was sucked under in the whirl by Nick's right leg and came to the surface a little way downstream. He floated rapidly, kicking in a quick circle, breaking the smooth surface of the water. He disappeared. A trout had taken him. Another hopper poked his face out of the bottle. His antennae wavered. He was getting his front legs out of the bottle to jump. Nick took him by the head and held him while he threaded the slim hook under his chin, down through his thorax, and into the last segments of his abdomen. The grasshopper took hold of the hook with his front feet, spitting tobacco juice on him. Nick dropped him into the water. Holding the rod in his right hand, he let out line against the pool of the grasshopper in a current. He stripped off line from the reel with his left hand and let it run free. He could see the hopper in little waves of current. It went out of sight. There was a tug on the line. Nick pulled against the taut line. It was his first strike. Holding now living rod across the current, he brought in the line with his left hand. The rod bent in jerks, the trout pumping against the current. Nick knew it was a small one. He lifted the rod straight up in the air. It bowed with the pool. He saw the trout in the water jerking with his head and body against the shifting tangents, tangent of the line in the stream. Nick took the line in his left hand and pulled the trout, thumping tardily against the current to the surface. His back was mottled the clear water of a gravel color, his side flashing in the sun, the rod under his right arm. Nick stopped, dipping his right hand into the current. He held the trout, never still with his moist right hand while he unhooked a bar from his mouth, then dropped him back into the stream. He hung unsteadily in the current then settled to the bottom side of stone. Nick reached down his hand to touch him, his arm to the elbow under the water. The trout was steady in the moving stream, resting on the gravel beside a stone. As Nick's fingers touched him, touched his smooth pool underwater, feeling he was gone, gone in a shadow across the bottom of the stream. He's all right, Nick thought. He was only tired. He had wet his hand before. He touched a trout so he would not disturb the delicate mucus that covered him. If a trout was touched with a dry hand, a white fungus attacked the unprotected spot. Years before when he had fished, crowded streams with fly fishermen ahead of him and behind him, Nick had again and again come on dead trout, furry with white fungus, drifted against a rock or floating belly up in some pool. Nick did not like to fish with other men on the river. Unless they were of your party, they spoiled it. He wallowed down the stream, above his knees in the current, through to fifty yards of shallow water above the pile of logs that crossed the stream. He did not rebate his hook, and held it in his hand as he waded. He was certain he could catch small trout in the shallows, but he did not want them. There would be no big trout in the shallows this time of day. Now the water deepened up his thighs sharply and coldly. Ahead was smooth, damp, back flood of water above the logs. The water was smooth and dark on the left, the lower edges of the meadow on the right, the swamp. Nick leaned back against the current and took a hopper from the bottle. He threaded the hopper on the hook and spat on him for good luck. Then he pulled several yards of line from the reel and tossed the hopper 
out ahead onto the fast, dark water. It floated down towards the logs. Then the weight of the line pulled the bait under the surface. Nick held the rod in his right hand, letting the line run out through his fingers. There was a long tug. Nick struck, and the rod came alive. And dangerous, bent double. The line tightened, coming out of the water, tight, all in a heavy, dangerous, steady pull. Nick felt the moment when the letter, leader would break if the strain increased and let the line go. The reel ratcheted into a mechanical streak as the line went out in a rush, too fast. Nick could not check it. The line rushing out, the reel note rising as the line ran out. With the core of the reel showing, his heart feeling stopped with excitement. Leaning back against the current with his mounted icily his thighs, Nick thumbed the reel hard with his left Nick thumbed the reel hard with his left hand. It was awkward getting his thumb inside the fly reel frame. As he put on pressure, the line tightened into sudden hardness. And beyond the logs, a huge trout went high out of the water. As he jumped, Nick lowered the tip of the rod. Buddy felt as he dropped the tip to ease the strain. The moment when the strain was too great, the hardness too tight, of course, the leader had broken. There was no mistaking the feeling when all spring left line and it became dry and hard, then it went slack. His mouth dry, his heart down, Nick reeled in. He had never seen so big a trout. There was a heaviness, a power not to be held, and then bulk of him as he jumped. He looked as broad as a salmon. Nick's hand was shaking. He reeled in slowly. The thrill had been too much. He felt vaguely a little sick, as though it would be better to sit down. The leader had broken the water where the hook was tied to it. Nick took it in his hand. He thought of the trout somewhere on the bottom, holding himself steady over the gravel, far down below the light, under the logs, with the hook in his jaw. Nick knew the trout's teeth would cut through the snell of the hook. The hook would embed itself in his jaw. He'd bet the trout was angry. Anything that size would be angry. That was a trout. He had been solidly hooked. Solid as rock. He felt like a rock, too, before he started off. By God, he was a big one. By God, he was the biggest one I ever heard of. Nick climbed out onto the meadow and stood water running down his trousers and out of his shoes, his shoes squelchy. He went over and sat on the logs. He did not want to rush his sensations out. He wriggled his toes in the water, in his shoes, and got out a cigarette from his breast pocket. He lit it and tossed the match into the fast water below the logs. A tiny trout rose at the match as it swung around in the fast current. Nick laughed. He would finish the cigarette. He sat on the log smoking, drying in the sun, the sun warm on his back, the river shallow ahead, entering the woods, curving into the woods, shallows, light glittering, big water smooth rocks, cedars along the bank, and white birches, the logs warm in the sun, smooth to sit on without bark, gray to the touch. Slowly the feeling of disappointment left him. It went away slowly, the feeling of disappointment, that came sharply after the thrill that made his shoulders ache. It was all right now. His rod lying out on the logs, Nick tied a new hook on the leader, pulling the gut tight until it crimped into itself in a hard knot. He baited it up and picked up the rod and walked to the far end of the logs to get into the water where it was not too deep. Under and beyond the logs was a deep pool. Nick walked around the shallow shelf near the swamp shore until he came out on the shallow bed of the stream. On the left, where the meadow ended and the woods began, a great elm tree was uprooted. Gone over in a storm, it lay back into the woods. Its roots clotted with dirt, grass growing in them, rising the solid bank beside the stream. The river cut to the edge of the uprooted trees. From where Nick stood, he could see deep chants, like ruts, cut in the shallow bed of the stream. 
I followed the current pebbly where it stood, and pebbly and full of boulders beyond, where it curved near tree roots. The bed of the stream was marly, and between the ruts of deep water, green weeds froms swung in the current. Nick swung the rod back over his shoulders and forward, and the line curving forward laid the grouse hopper down on one of the deep channels in the weeds. A trout struck, and Nick hooked him, holding the rod far out towards the uprooted tree and sloshing backwards in a current. Nick worked the trout, plunging the rod bending alive out of the danger of the weeds into the open river. Holding the rod, pumping alive against the current, Nick brought the trout in. He rushed, but always came the spring of the rod, yielding to rushes, sometimes jerking under water, but always bringing him in. Nick eased downstream with the rushes. The rod above his head, he led the trout over the net and lifted. The trout hung heavy in the net, mottled trout back and silver sides in the message. Nick unhooked him, heavy sides, good to hold, big undershot jaw, and slipped him, heaving and sliding, into the log sack that hung from his shoulders in the water. Nick spread the mouth of the sack against the current, and it filled heavy with water. He held it up, the bottom of the in he held it up the bottom in the stream, and the water poured out through the sides. Inside at the bottom was a big trout, alive in the water. Nick moved downstream, the sack out ahead of him, sunk heavy in the water, pooling from his shoulders. It was getting hot, the sun hot on the back of his neck. Nick had one good trout. He did not care about getting many trout. Now the stream was shallow and wide. There were trees on both banks and trees on the left bank made short shadows the current the forenoon sun Nick knew there were trout in each shadow in the afternoon after the sun had crossed towards the hills the trout would be in a cool shadow on the other side of the stream the very biggest ones would lie up close to the bank you could always pick them up there on the black when the sun was down they all moved out into the current just when the sun made the water blinding in the glare before it went down you were liable to strike a big trout anywhere in the current. It was almost impossible to fish them. The surface of the water was blinding as a mirror in the sun. Of course, you could fish upstream, but in a stream like the Black, or this, you had to wallow in the current, and in a deep place the water piled up on you. It was no fun to fish upstream with this much current. Nick moved along through a shallow stretch, watching the banks for deep holes. A beech tree grow close to the river, so the branches hung down into the water. The stream went back under the leaves. There was always trout in a place like that. Nick did not care about fishing that hole. He was sure he'd get hooked in the branches. He looked deep, though. He dropped the grasshopper, so the current took it under the water, back into the overhanging branch. The line pulled hard, and Nick struck. The trout threshed heavily, half out of water in the leaves and branches. The line was caught. Nick pulled hard and the trout was off. He reeled in, holding the hook in his hand, walking down the stream. Ahead, close to the left bank, was a big log. Nick saw it was hollow, pointing up river. The current entered it smoothly. Only a little ripple spread his side of the log. The water was deepening. The top of the hollow log was gray and dry. It was partly in the shadow. Nick took the cork out of the grasshopper bottle and a hopper clung to it. He picked him off hooked him and tossed him out. He held the rod far out so the hopper on the water moved into the current flowing into the hollow log. Nick lowered the rod and the hopper floated in. There was a heavy strike. Nick swung the rod against the pool. It felt as though he had hooked into the log itself, except for the live feeling. He tried to force the fish out into the current. It came heavily. The line went slack. Nick thought the trout was gone. Then he saw him very near in the current, shaking his head, trying to get the hook out. His mouth was clamped shut. He was fighting the hook in the clear flowing current. Looping in the line with his left hand, Nick swung the rod to make the line taut and tried to lead the trout towards the net, but he was gone, out of sight, the line pumping. Nick fought him against the current, letting him thump in the water against the spring of the rod. He shifted the rod to his left hand, worked the trout upstream, holding his weight, fighting on the rod, and then let him down into the net. He lifted him clear of the water, a heavy half circle in the net. The net dripping unhooked him and slid him into the sack. He spread the mouth of the sack and looked down at the big two trout alive in the water. 
Through the deepening water, Nick waded over to the hollow log. He took the sack off over his head, the trout flopping as it came out of the water, hung it up so the trout were deep in the water. Then he pulled himself up on the log and sat, the water from his trouser and boots running down into the stream. He laid his rod down, moved along the shady end of the log, and took sandwiches out of his pocket. He dipped the sandwiches in the cold water. The current carried away the crumbs. He ate the sandwiches and dipped his hat full of water to drink, the water running out through his hat just ahead of his drinking. It was cool in the shade, sitting on the log. He took a cigarette out and struck a match to light it. The match sunk into the gray wood, making a thin furrow. Nick leaned over to the side of the log and found a hard place and lit the match. He sat smoking, watching the river. Ahead, the river narrowed and went into a swamp. The river became smooth and deep, and the swamp looked solid with cedar trees, their trunks close together, their branches solid. It would not be possible to walk through a swamp like that. The branches grew so low. You would have to keep almost level with the ground to move at all. You could not crash through the branches. That must be why the animals that lived in swamps were built the way they were, Nick thought. He wished he had brought something to read. He felt like reading. He did not like going on into the swamp. He looked down the river. A big cedar slanted all the way across the stream. Beyond the river went into the swamp. Nick did not want to go in there now. He felt a reaction against the deep wading with the water deepening under his armpits to hook big trouts in their place is impossible to land him. In the swamp, the banks were bare. Big cedars came together overhead. The sun did not come through, except in patches. In fast deep water, in the half light, fishing would be tragic. And in the swamp, fishing was a tragic adventure. Nick did not want it. He did not want to go. He did not want to go down the stream any further today. He took out his knife, opened it, and stuck it in the log. Then he pulled up the sack, reached into it, and brought out one trout. Holding him near the tail, hard to hold, alive in his hand, he whacked him against the log. The trout quivered, rigid. Nick laid him on the log in the shade and broke the neck of the other fish in the same way. He laid them side by side on the log. They were fine trout. Nick cleaned them, slitting them from the vent to the tip of the jaw. All the insides and the gills and tongue came out in one piece. They were both males, long gray white strips of milk, smooth and clean, all the insides clean and compact, coming all together. Nick tossed the offal off shore for the minx to find. He watched the trout in the stream. When he held them back up in the water, they looked like live fish. Their color was not gone yet. He washed his hands and dried them on the log. He then laid the trout on the sack, spread out on the log, rolled them up in it, tied the bundle and put it in the landing net. His knife was still standing, blade stuck in the log. He cleaned it on the wood and put it in his pocket. Nick stood up on the log, holding his rod, the landing net hanging heavy, then stepped into the water and splashed ashore. He climbed the bank and cut up into the woods, towards the high ground. He was going back to camp. He looked back. The river was just showing through the trees. There were plenty of days coming when he could fish the swamp. The rain stopped as Nick turned in the road and that went up through the orchard. The fruit had been picked. The fall wind blew through the bare trees. Nick stopped and picked up a Wagner apple beside the road, shiny in the brown grass from the rain. He put the apple in the pocket of his Mackinac coat. The road came out of the orchard and on top of the hill. There was a cottage, the porch bare, smoke coming from the chimney. In the back was the garage, the chicken coop, and the second growth timber like a hedge against the woods behind. The big tree swayed far over in the wind as he watched. It was the first of the autumn storms. As Nick crossed the open field above the orchard, the door of the cottage opened and Bill came out. He stood on the porch looking out. Well, Wimage, he said. Hey, Bill, said Nick, coming up. They stood together, looking out across the country, down over the orchard, beyond the road, across the lower fields and the woods to the point of the lake. The wind was blowing straight down the lake. They could see the surf along 10 miles point. She's blowing, Nick said. She'll blow like that for three days, Bill said. Is your dad in? Nick said, no, he's going out with the gun. Come in. in. Nick went into the cottage. There was a big fire in the fireplace. The wind made it roar. Bill shut the door. Have a drink? 
He went out in the kitchen and came back with two glasses and a pitcher of water. Nick reached a whiskey bottle from the shelf above the fireplace. All right, good, said Bill. They sat in front of the fire and drank Irish whiskey in the water. It's got, it's got a swell smoky taste, Nick said and looked down at the fire through the glass. That's the peat. You can't get peat in the liquor, Nick said. That doesn't make any difference, Bill said. You ever seen any peat? Nick asked. No, neither have I, Nick said. His shoes stretched out of the hearth and began to stream in front of the fire. Better take your shoes off, Bill said. I haven't got any socks on. Take them off and dry them and I'll get you some, Bill said. He went upstairs into the loft and Nick heard him walking about overhead. Upstairs was open under the roof. And was where Bill and his father and he, Nick, sometimes slept. In the back was a dressing room. They moved the cots back out of the rain and covered them with rubber blankets. Bill came down with a pair of heavy wool socks. It's getting too late to go around without socks, he said. I hate to start them again, Nick said. He pulled the socks on and slumped back to the chair, putting his feet up and screened in front of the fire. You'll dent the screen, Bill said. Nick swung his feet on over to the side of the fire. Got anything to read, he asked. Only the paper. What'd the cards do? Drop doubleheader to the Giants? That ought to be a cinch for them. It's a gift, Bill said. As long as McGraw can buy every good ball player in the league, there's nothing to it. He can't buy them all, Nick said. He buys all the ones he wants, Bill said. Or he makes them disconnected, so they have to trade them to him. Like Heine Zimp, Nick agreed. That, that bonehead will do him a lot of good. Bill stood up. He can't hit, Nick offered. The heat from the fire was baking his legs. He's a sweet fielder, too, Bill said. But he loses the ball games. Maybe that's what McGraw wants him for, Nick suggested. Maybe, Bill agreed. There's always more to it than we know about, Nick said. Of course, but we've got a pretty good dope for being so far away. Like how much better you can pick them if you don't see the horses? That's it. Bill reached down the whiskey bottle. His big hand went all around it. He poured the whiskey into a glass and Nick held out. How much water? Just the same. He sat down on the floor beside Nick's chair. It's good when the fall storms come, isn't it? Nick said. It's swell. It's the best time of the year. Wouldn't it be hell to be in town? Bill said. I'd like to see the World Series, Nick said. Well, they're always in New York or Philadelphia now, Bill said. That doesn't do us any good. I wonder if the Cards will ever win a pennant. Not in our lifetime, Bill said. Gee, they go crazy. Do you remember when they got going that once before? They had the train wreck? Boy, Nick said, remembering. Bill reached over the table, down under the window, for a book that lay there, face down, where he put it when he went to the door. He held his glass in one hand and the book in the other, leaning back against Nick's chair. What, what are you reading? Richard Farrell? I couldn't get into it. It's all right, Bill said. It ain't a bad book, Wimmins. What else do you have? What, what else have you got I haven't read? Nick asked. Did you read Forest Lovers? Yup, that's the one where they go to bed every night with the naked sword between them. That's a good book, Wimmage. It's a swell book. What I couldn't ever understand was what good the sword would do. It would have to stay edge right up all the time, because if it went over flat, you could roll right over it. It wouldn't make any trouble. It's a symbol. Sure, said Nick, but it isn't practical. Did you ever read Fortitude? Oh, it's fine, Nick said. That's a real book. That's where his old man is after him all the time. Have you got any more by Walpole? It's a dark forest, Bill said. It's about Russia. What does he know about Russia, Nick asked. I don't know. You can't ever tell about those guys. Maybe he was there when he was a boy. He's got a lot of dope on it. I'd like to meet him. I'd like to meet Chesterson, Bill said. I wish he was here now, Nick said. We'd take him fishing to the Vox tomorrow. I wonder if he'd like to go fishing, Bill said. Sure, Nick said. He must be one of the best guys there is. Do you remember the flying in? 
If an angel out of heaven gives you something else to drink, thank him for his kind intentions. Go and pour them down the sink. That's right, said Nick. I guess he's a better guy than Walpole. Oh, better guy, all right. But Walpole's a better writer. I don't know. Chesterton's a classic. Walpole's a classic, too, Bill insisted. I wish we had both of them here, Nick said. We'd take them both fishing to the voice tomorrow. Let's get drunk, Bill said. All right, Nick agreed. My old man won't care, Bill said. Are you sure? I know it. I'm a little drunk now. You aren't drunk. He got up from the floor and reached a whiskey bottle. Nick held out his glass, his eyes fixed on it while Bill pulled. Bill poured the glass full of whiskey. Put in your own water. There's just one more shot. Got any more? Nick asked. There's plenty more, but Dad only likes me to drink what's open. Sure, said Nick. He says that opening his bottles would make drunkards, Bill explained. That's right, said Nick. He was impressed. He had never thought of that before. He had always thought it was solitary drinking that made drunkards. How is your dad? He asked respectfully. He's all right, Bill said. He gets a little wild sometimes. He's a swell guy, Nick said. He poured water into his glass out of the pitcher. He mixed it slowly with the whiskey. There was more whiskey than water. You bet your life he is, Bill said. My old man's all right, Nick said. You're damn right he is, said Bill. He claims he's never taken a drink in his life, Nick said, as announcing a scientific fact. Well, he's a doctor. My old man's a painter. That's different. He's missed a lot, Nick said sadly. You can't tell, Bill said. It's, everything's got his compensations. He says he's missed a lot himself, Nick confessed. Well, Dad's had a tough time, Bill said. It's all evens up, Nick said. They sat looking into the fire, thinking of this profound truth. I'll get a chunk from the back porch, Nick said. He had noticed while looking down the fire that the fire was dying down. Also, he wished to show that he could hold his liquor and be practical. Even if his father had never touched a drop, Bill was not going to get him drunk before he himself was drunk. Bring one of the big beach trunks, Bill said. He was also being consciously practical. Nick came in with the log through the kitchen and, passing, knocked a pan off the kitchen table. He laid the log down and picked up the pan. It contained dried apricots soaking in water. He carefully picked up all the apricots off the floor. Some of them had gone under the stove, put them back in the pan. He dipped some more water onto them from the pail by the table. He felt quite proud of himself. He had been thoroughly practical. He came in carrying the log, and Bill got up from the chair and helped him put it in the fire. That's a, that's a swell log. I've been saving it for bad weather, Bill said. A log like that will burn all night. There'll be coals left to start the fire with in the morning, Nick said. That's right, Bill agreed. They were conducting the conversation on a high plane. Let's have another drink, Nick said. I think there's another open bottle in the locker, Bill said. He kneeled down in the corner in front of the locker, poured out a square-faced bottle. It's scotch. I'll get some more water, Nick said. He went into the kitchen again. He filled the pitcher with the dipper dipping cold spring water from the pail. On his way back to the living room, he passed a mirror in the dining room and looked into it. His face looked strange. He smiled at the face in the mirror, and it grinned back at him. He winked at it and went on. It was not his face, but didn't make any difference. Bill had poured out the drinks. That's an awfully big shot, Nick said. Not for us, Whamage, Bill said. What do we drink to, Nick asked, holding up the glass. Let's drink the fishing, Bill said. All right, Nick said. Gentlemen, I give you fishing. All fishing, Bill said, everywhere. Fishing, Nick said, that's what we drink too. It's better than baseball, Bill said. There is Nick comparison, said Nick. How did we ever get talking about baseball? It was a mistake. Baseball is a game for louts. They drank all that was in their glasses. Now, let's drink to Chesterton. And Walpole, Nick interposed. Nick poured out the liquor. Bill poured in the water. They looked at each other. They felt very fine. Gentlemen, I give you Chesterton and Walpole. Exactly, gentlemen, Nick said. They drank. Bill filled up the glasses. They sat down in the big chairs in front of the fire. You were very wise, women, Bill said. What do you mean? 
asked Nick. To bust off that Marge business. I guess so, said Nick. It was the only thing to do. If you hadn't, by now you'd be back home, working, trying to get enough money to get married. Nick said nothing. Once a man's married, he's absolutely bitched, Bill went on. He hasn't got anything more, nothing, not a damn thing. He's done for. You've seen the guys that got married. Nick said nothing. You can tell them, Bill said. They get this sort of fat married look. They're done for. Sure, said Nick. It was probably bad busting off, Bill said. But you can always fall for somebody else, and then it's all right. Fall for them, but don't let them ruin you. Yes, Nick said. If you'd have married her, we'd have married a whole family. Remember her mother and that guy she married? Nick nodded. Imagine having them around the house all the time, going to Sunday dinners at their house, having them over dinner, her telling Marge all the time what to do and how to act. Nick sat quiet. You came out of it damn well, Bill said. Now she can marry somebody of her own sort and settle down and be happy. You can't mix oil with water and you can't mix that sort of thing any more than... I'd marry Ida if that works for the Stratton, she'd probably like it too. Nick said nothing. The liquor had all died out of him and he left him alone. Bill wasn't there. He was sitting in front of the fire or going fishing tomorrow with Bill and his dad or anything. He wasn't drunk. It was all gone. All he knew was that he had once had Marjorie and he had lost her. She was gone and he had sent her away. That was all that mattered. He might never see her again. Probably he never would. It was all gone finished. Let's have another drink, Nick said. Bill poured it out. Nick splashed in a little water. If he'd gone on that way, we wouldn't be here now, Bill said. That was true. His original plan had been to go down home and get a job. Then he planned to go stay in Charlotte Vegas all winter long so he could be near March. Now he did not know what he was going to do. Probably wouldn't even be going fishing tomorrow, Bill said. You had to write dope, all right. I couldn't help it, Nick said. I know, that's the way it works out. All of a sudden, everything was over, Nick said. I don't know why it was. I couldn't help it. Just like when the three-day blows come down and rip all the leaves off the trees. Well, it's over. That's the point. It was my fault, Nick said. It doesn't make a difference whose fault it was, Bill said. No, I suppose not, Nick said. The big thing was that Marjorie was gone and that probably he'd never see her again. He had talked to her about when they were going to Italy together and the fun they would have. Places they'd be together, it was all gone now. So long as it's over, it's all that matters, Bill said. I tell you, Wimage, I was worried what was going on. You played it right. I understand her mother was sore as hell. She told you a lot of people we were engaged. We weren't engaged, Nick said. It was all around that you were. I can't help it, Nick said. We weren't. Weren't you going to get married, Bill asked. Yes, but we weren't engaged, Nick said. What's the difference, Bill asked judicially. I don't know. There's a difference. I don't see it, said Bill. All right, said Nick. Let's get drunk. All right, Bill said. Let's get really drunk. Let's get drunk and go swimming, Nick said. He drank off his glass. I'm sorry as hell about her, but what can I do, he asked. You know what her mother was like. She was terrible. All of a sudden it was over, Nick said. I don't talk about it. You aren't. I talked about it and now I'm through. We will never speak about it again. You don't want to think about it. You might get back into it again. Nick had not thought about that. It seemed so absolute. That was thought. It made him feel better. Sure, he said. Well, there's always that danger. He felt happy now. There was not anything irrevocable. He might go in town Saturday night. Today was Thursday. There's always a chance, he said. You'll have to watch yourself. I'll have to watch myself, he said. He felt happy. Nothing was finished. Nothing was ever lost. He could go into town Saturday. He felt lighter than he had felt before Bill started to talk about it. There was always a way out. Let's take the guns and go down to the point and look for your dad, Nick said. All right. Bill took out two shotguns from the rack on the wall. He opened a box of shells. Nick put on his Mac and call coat and his shoes. His shoes were stiff from drying. He was still quite drunk and his head was clear. How do you feel, Nick asked. Swell, I've got a good edge on. Bill was buttoning up his sweater. There's no use in getting drunk. No, we ought to get outdoors. They stepped out the door. The wind was blowing a gale. The birds will lie right down in the grass with this, Nick said. They struck towards the orchard. I saw a woodcock this morning, Bill said. Maybe we'll jump him, Nick said. You can't shoot in this wind, Bill said. Outside now, the Marge business was no longer no, so tragic. It was not even very important. The wind blew everything like that away. It's coming right off the big lake, Nick said. Against the wind, they heard the thud of a shotgun. 
That's Dad, Bill said. He's down in the swamp. Let's cut down that way, Nick said. Let's cut across the lower matter and see if we jump anything, Bill said. All right, Nick said. None of it was important now. The wind blew it out of his head. Still, he could always go to town Saturday night. It was a good thing to have in reserve. Oh, that was a three-day blow from in our time with Hemingway. And that was came before the first story. <laughs> I put him backwards. 